Welcome back to another episode of the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. As you all know, we usually bring you conversations with college admissions representatives, offering valuable advice and tips to navigate the admissions journey. But today, we have something different for you as we're flipping the script. That's right. I had the absolute pleasure of being interviewed by Mike Bergen and Amy Seely, who are the fantastic hosts of their own podcast called Tests and the Rest, the College Admissions Industry Podcast. They were intrigued by the guests we've had on our show, so they graciously invited me to share my own experiences and insights from the other side of the microphone. So we delved into a wide range of topics from my experiences interviewing admissions representatives to the latest trends and challenges students face today. I want to express my deepest gratitude to both Mike and Amy for allowing me to share this conversation with all of you. Their insightful questions really got me thinking, and I can't wait for you to hear what we discussed. I hope you'll enjoy the episode as much as I enjoyed being a part of it. And don't forget to give their podcast a listen as well. So without further ado, let's jump right into the interview and explore the college admissions process. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome, everyone. I'm Amy Seeley, president of Seeley Test Pros, helping students succeed in all kinds of tests from eighth grade to grad school in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm Mike Bergen, President of Chariot Learning, helping students with test school and life based out of Rochester, New York. Between the two of us today, we have over 55 years of experience at the highest levels of the test preparation and supplemental education industries. We both love to talk and learn about the latest issues in education, testing, and admissions. So let's get down to tests and the rest. The fascinating topic we want to explore today is how to speak to a college admissions rep. But first, let's meet our special guest, John Durante. Dr. John Durante graduated from Stony Brook University. He has been the principal of Syosset High School for 13 years and has been named best principal on Long Island and received the PTA Founders Day Award and Jenkins Award. He started his career at Syosset High School in 1994 as a teacher of world languages, and he prides himself on helping others. After helping his daughters through the college admissions process, he came up with the idea of interviewing college admissions representatives to provide students and parents with insight and advice, straight from the people who ultimately make the admissions decisions, launching the College Admissions Process podcast in February 2022. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Amy and Mike. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to a great conversation. John, we're looking to look forward to a great conversation, too. Not only do we have an outstanding topic to cover, but it is a rare privilege to have a fellow <laughs> podcaster and fellow Stony Brook alum on the show. <laughs> so before we dive into our topic, I want to hear all about your history as an educator and how you moved into educational podcasting. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, go Stony Brook, go Seawolves, right? That's go Seawolves. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So I appreciate that. So like Amy said, I've been at Syosset High School now for 29 years, 13 years as the high school principal. But really what led me to the podcast was during the pandemic, I became a big fan of podcasts in terms of listening to them. It was also around the time that I was helping my oldest daughter and youngest going through the college process as a parent. And what I realized is that so many people were skeptical in terms of reaching out to college reps, and many of them didn't even know the questions to ask. I had to become that parent that really had to advocate for their kid, particularly my youngest, who had an IEP in high school. School didn't come easy for her. And so as a parent, I went through the stresses that so many people go through. And so I came up with the idea of wanting to do a podcast But I don't know if you guys know, but 80% of the podcasts usually fail because it's a lot of work, as you both know. Yes. (laughs) So I said, if I'm going to put the time and energy into it, I have to do something that's truly going to help people. So thanks to going through the college admissions process with my daughters, I came up with the idea of there are so many reps that have been so good to me in terms of helping me through it. I wonder if they would get on, have a conversation with me about their schools and all the great things they have to offer giving them insight in terms of their overall application review process. And finally, the last question is always, what are your top three pieces of advice you would provide a student and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? As of this recording, there's 123 episodes that are live. I'm releasing every Monday and Wednesday. 
And I've literally had representatives from every corner of the United States. And I'm looking to go international, Mike. I'm trying to get a couple of uh, international schools as well. So we know tuned. we can make some <laughs> connections for you. Thank you. <laughs> so that's basically my story. And, you know, and I did it because, again, I know the stress of helping a child, particularly that has an IEP. I also know how accessible the reps are. And I had an idea of what questions to ask. And I couldn't believe that so many people are afraid to reach out. So again, the idea was born and here we are. It's such a great idea. We really enjoy your podcast and we're thrilled to have you on the show because after speaking to so many college reps from a position where you're not actually in the college admissions process, you're coming to it more as a parent and an educator and somebody who's knowledgeable but adjacent you probably have learned so much that we can all benefit from. So the idea of how to speak to a college admissions rep, it's a great question to explore because college admissions reps are such a fundamental part of the college admissions process. And yet I think that they're very often overlooked. You know, they're the people that you meet on the scenes at school visits or college fairs. Nobody really knows exactly how influential they are in this process, how much they know. <laughs> um, so let's start by just in your experience, not like the, this is what somebody tells me, but in your experience, after speaking to so many college reps, what do you see as their fundamental role? Their fundamental role, Mike, is that they are admissions representatives. They really want to admit each and every student. And of course, they take a holistic approach. They look at the transcript, which of course is the academic portion of the application. They look at your essay, which is your voice about who you are. They look at the student activity sheet, which of course is what you did outside of the classroom. Recommendation letters, which of course is someone else's voice about you. So they look at it holistically. We hear this in just about every single podcast episode. And so as a student and parent, what that means is that you have to be very mindful to understand how each part of the marketing package, right? Your overall application. Each part has to build upon the next, showing the best essence of you as the candidate without repeating. So for example, if I'm an athlete and on my activity sheet, I write that I play soccer and I help younger kids with their soccer skills. And then my essay basically repeats exactly what's on the activity sheet. It's a missed opportunity. Right. because it's already there. So that's one of the main points that I learned in terms of how to approach the application and how to be very mindful of how each piece has to build on the next. Some schools ask for supplemental questions. It's important, students and parents, that when you have that supplemental question, to treat it just like you treated the essay. Many times students spend weeks, maybe even months, on their general essay, and they see, oh, geez, this school has two supplementals, and they want to just rush through it. You shouldn't. Again, each piece has to build on the next while understanding that a supplemental question, it's not asking you your demonstrated interest, but it is asking your demonstrated understanding of that school. So it's very important in that supplemental. A lot of times the question will be, why NYU, for example? And what they're looking to see in that portion is that you really understand their institution you are going to explain how you're going to contribute to their community if you're a student. And that's basically what they're looking for there. You you mentioned something earlier, which I think is kind of important in this conversation, which is you said, you know, the student is marketing to the school, right? We all know that. But a valuable role for the admissions rep is they are also marketing their school. There's a very interesting marketing, you know, opportunity on both sides. What you just said is interesting because when we do think about these supplementals, like these Y school X, this, the admissions rep in their marketing efforts to a student, a student could actually capitalize on that in understanding the school better to understand how to sort of mirror back why they are such a, would be such a valuable asset on the campus, right? Absolutely. It's definitely a two-way street. And we always talk about the fact that for every single person applying to college, for each and every person, there's definitely more than one school for them. But it's equally important to understand that not every school is for every student. Hence the importance of not worrying about where mom and dad went, not worrying about 
you know, which sticker we're going to put on the back of the car, not worrying about where your friends are going to go. It's very important to do your research, start early. Thank heavens today, whether it's podcast or virtual meetings, there are so many resources online, far more than we ever had when we were younger. And so it's really important to take advantage. And visiting campus is key. It's tough, especially if you go to schools across the country. So what I always say is if you can't visit the campus before you apply, you owe it to yourself to visit before you matriculate. So um, there's so much that I learned. I mean, I could really go on forever, guys. No, of course. <laughs> but, you know, the college admissions rep, it's interesting because you said that a college admissions rep, and again, I'm thinking of like them as the representatives out in the field, they want to admit everybody. To your point, Amy, like they're marketing, they are hype men. They are salesmen. They, I mean, they, are they are salesmen. They are salesmen. They're not out there trying to tell you, don't come to our school. Something very interesting happened a couple of weeks ago. Amy and I were at the IACA conference in Seattle, and I was giving a panel presentation, and I had some directors of admissions with me, and uh, John McEachran is the director of admissions for Boston University, and during the Q&A, somebody attacked him. Like it was really like an wow. unwarranted attack, had nothing to do with the topic we were talking about. It was just like, why do you market to all of these students that can't ever get into your school? And I think to your point, John, the reps aren't thinking that. They're trying to share for the world all the benefits. This is why you should consider this school. And the sorting comes later. Right. Reps aren't out in the field trying to, you know, point to people. I want to talk to you three, you two, you might not want to show up. <laughs> well, that's why we talk about college admissions like a dating app, right? Because <laughs> the idea is the colleges want to signal to everybody, I want to date you. But then they really <laughs> don't necessarily <laughs> want to date you. <laughs> well, it's true because what makes it even more um, stressful and difficult is the fact that there are institutional needs. So in the conversations, I didn't interview UNC, but in one of the conversations, Rick Clark, who's the director of admissions at Georgia Tech, mm -hmm. he talked about his alma mater and how, for example, in UNC's case, they can't accept more than 18% of their students from out of state. So there are a lot of institutional needs, which is why a kid could have a great academic record, do anything and everything outside of the classroom, and they get accepted to Stanford, but they get waitlisted to, I don't know, Yale or whatever, you know, pick the uh, Ivy League school. OK, and so that's because of the institutional needs. So it's very important in the process to be mindful of what you control and what you don't control. And what you control, students, is throughout your four years of high school, build ramps. Take challenges based on what your high school offers in terms of the rigor, right? Keep building those ramps academically. Be involved in your school because reps also want to know what kind of community member are you going to be when you come to our campus? So based on activities that you've participated in, that's a great indication of what kind of roommate you're going to be, what kind of classmate you're going to be. In terms of your transcript, past academic history is a pretty good indicator in terms of how you're going to do once you're on their campus. And reps are there to admit, but they review holistically to ensure that you could handle the work once on their campus, but that you're also going to be, like I said, a contributor to their community. John, when it comes to those institutional priorities, you know, I think about the kind of questions that, that we want to ask, the parents, more important students want to ask the reps. Is there any way to ask questions about institutional priorities without saying those words. Is there, like, would it be wise for students who are applying to an out-of-state school talking to a rep to say, you know, do you have a strict percentage of students from out-of-state that you accept? Is that a fair question to ask? Yes. And I ask it. Many times I ask it. And depending on whether the school is private or public, it will vary. So the public right. institutions, based on their board of trustees and the governments, you know, state governments, they have percentages that they can't increase or go over, right? So I mentioned the example of UNC. Clemson, I want to say it was higher, maybe somewhere in the 30% range from what I remember now. After yeah, I think UC is probably getting lower. They're probably right. taking fewer students from out of California. That's correct. And I did quite a few UC schools. In fact, I just recorded, it's not released yet, with UC San Diego. But the point is, yes, you can ask the question. And that's the part of the genesis in terms of why I did the podcast is because people are so afraid to ask the questions. They exactly. think it's a stigma. 
Yeah, no, I think, and that's that's what's interesting is I think we within this industry and talking to college admissions people, we obviously are not afraid to ask the <laughs> questions. Um, but I think, like you said earlier, there's this fear somehow on the part of students or parents that if they ask the question somewhere in a secret notebook, it is recorded that that question was asked and that's somehow <laughs> going to track. And it's like, no, actually, um, all we really want any of us want, I think, in this industry is transparency. And I personally find that when I ask admissions rep directly questions, I usually get straight answers. So I think don't be afraid to ask the questions, right? Right. So what other questions would both of you suggest asking reps? Again, not as professionals, right? It's easy for us. There's no stakes. We all went to college already. <laughs> Go see whoops. Um, it's, it's what, you know, the student for whom this rep may be the ambassador for first choice school, what kind of questions would you, are good to ask? So let me start by saying, first of all, try not to ask questions that are so easy to find on their website. Right. Those are questions that, that definitely make you look bad. Well, right? they reveal something about <laughs> low your, information your questions. Right. questions. Right. right. And so in terms of questions that you should ask, again, first of all, be mindful of that. And there are so many. So some examples, talk to me about your average class size. Does it change though over four years, right? Because I remember at Stony Brook as a freshman, I took multiple classes in a lecture hall, but because I was- that hall looked like 300 students, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, but then when I really got into my major, and in my case, I, I used to be a world language teacher. So I majored in, you know, Italian and Spanish. But the point being is that when I got into my major, my classrooms looked very much like it did in my high school, right? With no more th than 30 students. So asking about class size and how it changes, asking about housing, do you guarantee it for four years? No? Well, what do you mean as a junior, I have to live off campus? What are my options? The test optional movement. One of the questions that I've been asking is, you say you're test optional, fantastic. <laughs> What's the percentage of students that right. not only applied, but that were accepted who did not submit their test scores. Good luck getting that date. Well, no, but I would I would say <laughs> well, take that a step farther. I have found that if you ask an admissions rep directly and you share, you can share, here's what the scores are. They will generally advise you and say, don't submit, right. submit. Like, I think that families would be afraid. They think, oh, nobody should know what the scores are. But I do think that is a question that is a valid question that they should be able to give you really good advice about submit or don't submit. And I've been asking that question in most of my podcast episodes, and I'm happy to say that th they are answering it. And That's great. In, in most cases, it's really a 50-50 split. That's what they're reporting to me in all of the podcast episodes. Important to note, though, you mentioned the mid-50 percent, Amy. It's important to note that that mid-50 today, right, because it's test optional and only students that, as you said, are happy with their scores are submitting, that the mid-50 is skewed. That's so it's a lot 100 higher. percent accurate. Yes, it's getting higher. higher and it reflects a fact that now that schools can cherry pick the scores and say, don't submit that bad score. We only want to submit that we only want the higher scores that definitely skews perception of what kind of scores you need to get in a school. Exactly. So be mindful of that. And what the reps are saying is if you're in the mid 50 and you feel that your test score is a great indicator of who you are academically. And it's going to help your overall marketing package or the application, submit it. And if we say we're test optional, then don't. The UC schools, which you mentioned earlier, they're test blind. So even if you submit, they're not right. looking at it. That's right. So it's not a myth. It's a real thing. You know, now some schools that are far more competitive, you know, it, 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 obviously it's a little different, you know, the Harvards and the Yales of the world. But the other thing to be mindful of with the test optional movement, a school may say that they're test optional. Very important to check the intended major. For example, if you're planning on being an engineer, nursing, right, which is a very competitive major, there may be test uh, requirements within right. the certain major. So it's very important for students and parents to be mindful of that as well. That is a great piece of advice. We've seen that, I think, for engineering programs. Like, it really depends on the program and the school. There are a lot of good questions to ask. Has anyone ever asked, like, is my application too strong? Will you turn me down because you think I won't come? <laughs> Am I too good? Is that Am a fair good? question to ask? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it's a very, it's a fair question. I haven't ever asked it. I'm wondering if others have. But, you know, what I can tell you that did come up in many of the conversations is 
the first 20 percent of the students that were rejected is their profile equal to the students they got accepted and the answer most reps will tell you is absolutely yeah right you know and the reason is because to keep it in simple terms if you're a school that's looking to admit a freshman class of a thousand students and you're getting 15,000 applications you know i want to say that maybe i don't know 10,000 of those applications are viable candidates so how do you decide yeah. and so they take the holistic approach they look at the institutional needs and they'll tell you that there's um, there's no secret sauce. It's a really tough job. And, and what makes it even tougher is that, you know, many students and parents are recognizing this, which means that more and more students are applying to more and more schools. That's right. Which is making the, the entire common app makes it really easy to do that. Right. Which is making the whole academic uh, admissions process even more difficult. Right. Uh, so agreed. It's a, it's a so now <laughs> you said there's no secret sauce, but maybe there's a little secret sauce. And you mentioned earlier the idea of demonstrated interest. And I wonder how students can demonstrate authentic interest, like speak to reps in a way, or just even like if it comes down to opening their emails to make that signal that could be a difference maker. Do you have yeah. advice on, on that area, John? I do. So the, the basic things with demonstrated interest is, of course, talk to a rep if they come to your high school, go to a college fair, scan the QR code. If there's a card, write your name. Those are the basic things. Visit campus and what have you. And by the way, if they send you an email, open the email. If there are links, engage in links. the links. People yes. don't realize that they know all of that information. They know exactly for every applicant yes. how many emails they've opened, what time they opened the emails, yes. <laughs> all of that information. So it's very important to engage. But in terms of demonstrating your interest, whether or not a school says that they track it as part of their application review process, it's very important to do some of those things that we just mentioned because here's a scenario. Amy and I are on the wait list. There's a seat available. It's unjust. You're both great candidates. We're pretty good. I'm not, but Amy's <laughs> awesome. But anyway, the point being is that, so John here didn't open up the emails, didn't engage, maybe stopped by the rep when he came by my school, my high school. And so I didn't really do much. Amy, on the other hand, opened the email, clicked on the links, went to a college fair, went on campus twice because she's perfect. So, <laughs> In every that, admi <laughs> so that admissions rep, if Amy showed real demonstrated interest, that, that, that admissions rep may advocate for Amy more than they would for me because Amy kept a relationship. Maybe you sent them an email, Amy, asking something that was not easily found on their website. These are things that you should do, whether the rep said that they demonstrate the interest as part of the application process or not, do it because you never know if you get waitlisted, if it's going to help you, or if they're trying to determine who's accepted or going to a waitlist or even going to be denied. If you have that relationship with the rep, it could only help you. It's not going to hurt you. So take advantage of that. Well, I'm going to add to that, this idea of meeting a rep face to face, right? Where they actually, you're not just a name, you're you're a face or a person that they've engaged with. Um, I'm wondering how much do we see these admissions rep actually being a part of the selection process? Do you find with your conversations that they are actually the people involved in reading your application and, and making those selections? Absolutely. Absolutely. Each and every one of the reps that I interview are absolutely part of that process. They're at the table. In many cases, it's the actual director of admissions that I'm interviewing. Also, there are admissions counselors, their assistant. You know, there's there's many, many titles that they all hold. But each and every one of the reps absolutely has a, a part in their overall admissions process. You know, and that's the whole point of my podcast is to interview people that ultimately make the decisions might not be the final decision. It's never, you know, even the even the directors of admissions have to follow the needs of their institution, their board of trustees. But these pe these are people that are at the table for sure. And it's probably worth mentioning most institutions, especially the larger they get, that there are regional admissions reps. And those are the ones who are going to be directly involved probably in reading your application. So while, yes, the director or head of admissions is a person that you might want to talk to, more importantly, the person who's your geographical representative is probably the one that's going to read that application, right? Absolutely. And that's usually the person that is going to come to your high school. 
That's usually the person that you'll meet at a local college fair. So it's very important to establish those relationships and to put a name with a face and, of course, a name face with that application. This is phenomenal. You know, John, we could definitely talk with you all day about speaking to admissions reps and so many other things. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it was an honor and pleasure to meet with both of you. Good luck to everyone as you uh, pursue the college admissions process. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.